Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 17H, which is hematology, hemostasis, and thrombosis, and we are streaming live from IMS and SUM Hospital, Bhubaneswar, via Kolkata. And a very important topic, which is hemostatic alterations in liver disease and liver transplantation. And to talk on that, we have somebody who is an expert in hematopathology, Dr. Rajesh Kumar Bhola. He is an MD path with fellow in the laboratory hematology from CMC Vellore, an associate professor and in charge laboratory hematology division department of pathology at the famous IMS and SUM hospital, Shikshao Anusandhan, deemed to be a university Bhubaneswar, Orissa. His areas of interest are hematolymphoid neoplasm, flow cytometry, coagulation and laboratory automation. He is <coughs> known for his the fact that he established the laboratory hematology department at the Center of Excellence in Odisha. Received the Times Healthcare Icon Award for 2019, Odisha for medical excellence in the field of hematology, best paper in the APCON 2011, Odisha chapter, with eight publications in national and international journal. Lead site investigator for international collaborative project. Before I ask Dr. Bowler to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, may I request, sir, please share your screen. Let's start. Thank you, uh, Dr. Syed, for your nice introduction. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, the entire Nilam Pathology team and Dr. Syed for giving me the opportunity to present uh, on this forum. And they are doing uh, tremendous work uh, by organizing this kind of uh, topics uh, for the residents uh, to bring more understanding into pathology, make them more interesting. My, my screen is being shared. Yes, sir. Just, just share your PowerPoint. I made it full screen. Is it uh, visible? No, sir. No, sir. It's not. Yeah, now it's visible. Please start. Thank you so much. Good to go. Thank you. So today uh, I'll be uh, elaborating or I'll be discussing on one of the more important aspect where uh, the concepts are getting changed. It is hemostatic alteration in liver disease and liver transplant. To start with, uh, we will start with a case study. So it is just like a usual case study of a 54-year male, is chronic alcoholic, in, uh, who is having an increasing abdominal distension since last two months. He had no fever, chill, or abdominal pain, or hematemesis, or any spontaneous bleeding has not been absorbed in this case. His vitals are stable, and there is a non-tender distended abdomen with shifting of dullness indicates that is ascites, and ultrasound uh, just confirms it. There is a large volume ascites, and cirrhotic abdominal liver. Liver is there. So the diagnosis is very straightforward. So it is a case of cirrhosis of liver. Looking at the laboratory workup, the hemoglobin is 12.3 gram per deciliter. WBC count is 5,100. Per microliter, platelet count is 55,000 and his PT INR, which is a very commonly being uh, asked test in any coagulation workup, was uh, found to be 2.8. So here, uh, the biggest question is that does this patient is at bleeding risk? Looking at the platelet count, looking at a uh, uh, prolonged PT, uh, elevated PT INR. So whenever such uh, scenarios uh, comes in front of us, uh, we have a tra traditional belief. So what is the traditional belief? That raised prothrombin time seen in liver disease are commonly expressed as an INR and they usually reflect whenever the INR is uh, elevated or early INR is uh, uh, increased, they usually reflect a bleeding risk. And how do we uh, go ahead with the management? We go ahead with the management by correction with the plasma products, that is fresh frozen plasma, as which can reduce or correct the hemostatic failure. And whenever the platelets are reduced, uh, we are very skeptical about uh, platelet, low plat thrombocytopenia induced bleeding. So platelet, we will usually think that platelet transfusion is going to help in these cases, even when we are going for a, an elective liver biopsy procedure. So this is what we believe. And uh, when we look really into different studies uh, that like uh, one of the study being done by Lee J where they have looked into the association of coagulopathy with the risk of bleeding 
and what they found that only 33.9% of chronic liver disease patients have actually coagulopathy. So what do you mean by coagulopathy over here is that the PT INR is more than 1.5 and the platelet count is less than or equal to 50,000. And uh, what they have observed in their study is that the major bleeding after an invasive procedure only occurred with 2.4%. So had it been our traditional belief is correct, there should have been more percentage of bleeding that should happen in case of an invasive procedure. So based upon these findings, the uh, recent guideline in 2020 by the British Society of Gastroenterology, the Royal College of Radiologists and Royal College of Pathology have proposed uh, the clinical practice guideline for the liver biopsy and what they uh, have proposed is that hematological parameters in many patients with liver disease are abnormal with disturbance of both thrombolysis and coagulation. So mind it, thrombolysis and coagulation both are abnormal. And the traditional measure of platelet count and prothrombin time do not give an accurate reflection of the coagulation status of the patient. And whenever the INR, INR is more than 1.5, preferably a transvenous root, that is transjugular root, is being favored for a liver biopsy. But one can safely do a percutaneous lesional biopsy even with a INR of 1.4 to 2.0. But whenever there is a INR is more than 2.0, a preferred root must be a transvenous root. And there is no evidence that FFP or trace frozen plasma is effective in reducing the bleeding manifestation. Looking at the platelet transfusion, the effectiveness and the risk of platelet transfusion for a platelet count less than 50,000 have not been established, but yes, they can be considered whenever the 50,000 less than 50,000 platelet count is being uh, found, one can think of a prophylactic platelet transfusion, but it is not an established criteria. And platelet count, whenever again is less than 50,000, the preferred route is a transvenous approach. So what you can see is that uh, there is a discrepancy between what is we are absorbing, what we are believing, and what our guidelines are saying us. So this discrepancy, I'm trying to explain and make you more better understand through uh, this presentation. And what are the learning objective of this presentation? To understand that there is an hemostatic alteration in liver disease that is actually the rebalance between a procoagulant, anticoagulant and the fibrinolytic system. And what are the limitations of uh, currently available laboratory tests for evaluating the coagulopathy of the liver disease? Because we cannot apply the currently available test uh, upfront for a coagula explaining a coagulopathy in liver disease. And the, what are the triggers that can lead to acute bleeding in liver diseases? So these are the things I think by end of my presentation, I, will, I can uh, do justice to these objectives. To start with, uh, what is the importance of the liver in hemostasis? So liver plays an important role in hemostasis because it is the site of production of many of the coagulation factors and their inhibitors. It is a site of vitamin K dependent modulation of the clotting factor. It is also responsible for clearance and degradation of the factors and factor inhibitor complexes. And one of the major uh, site for synthesis of thrombopoietin and as you know, thrombopoietin is responsible for thrombopoietic activities within the marrow leading to platelet production. So when we talk so much, so what do you mean by coagulation? So coagulation is the process by which blood forms clot and it is an important part of hemostasis where in a damaged blood vessel wall is covered by a platelet and fibrin containing clot. So the clot, the basic components are platelet and fibrin and what is the purpose is to stop bleeding and begin repair of the damaged vessel. So what is hemostasis? Hemostasis is a tightly regulated process and that tries to maintain the blood in a fluid state in a normal vessel. And it also permits the rapid formation of the hemostatic clot whenever there is a vascular injury is there. And the normal hemostasis has basically four components that is arteriolar vasoconstriction, primary hemostasis which is 
done by the platelet von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen and other receptors on the surface of the platelet. Secondary hemostasis which is mainly involves the coagulation factors and the fourth is the stabilization of the hemostatic blood by thrombotic and antithrombotic events. What is the role of the platelet? As you know this platelet whenever it comes uh, or encounters the extracellular matrix such as collagen and adhesive glycoprotein that is von Willebrand factor it will undergo uh, adhesion followed by your shape change followed by your secretory reaction or the release reaction followed by platelet platelet aggregation. Try to understand through this cartoon in a normal state uh, there are inactive procoagulants in the circulation and the platelets are there. So, whenever there is a breach in the blood vessels these inactive procoagulants now outpour the blood elements and important factors at the site of the bridging in the blood vessel. So, due to this breezing what happens this subendothelial collagen is exposed and as I have told the coagulation factors and platelets are outpouring. So, they are getting exposed or they are get coming in contact with this exposed subendothelial collagen. So, that is where the primary hemostasis starts. Who is the major factor or major player here is the von Willebrand factor. So, von Willebrand factor acts as an adhesive protein in a large multimeric protein that binds spontaneously to the exposed collagen through its outer A3 domain. Usually what happens the von Willebrand factor remains as a spiral. So, due to that the active A1 domain is internalized and whenever there is a breach this A3 comes in contact with the collagen and it uh, unrolls like a carpet. So, exposing your A1 domain. With this A1 domain, now the platelet comes in contact with it uh, with uh, A1 domain of the von Willebrand factor through platelet adhesion protein that is glycoprotein 1B. So, that leads to your platelet activation and there is a flip, flippage and floppage mechanism that which the platelet gets activated and your glycoprotein 2B3A is reorganized and the, the glycoprotein 2B3A of two platelets come in contact with each other and they are being connected by the fibrinogen to form the platelet aggregation. But there is a problem happens whenever the von Willebrand factor is not with a large multimer. So, what happens whenever the platelet comes in contact with the von Willebrand factor is of a large multimer, it gradually slows down by rolling over the von Willebrand factor. Whenever von Willebrand factor is smaller in nature, the rolling mechanism after some time is dislocated or dislodged and the platelet again goes into circulation. So, a strong platelet plug cannot be formed if von Willebrand factor is a, does not have a large multimer. And as you know, Adam TS13 is one of the molecules which in circulation actually clips this large multimers of the von Willebrand factor and that may be one of the reason why in vivo during circulation without any breach in the blood vessels, uh, there is no clot formation. So, now the platelet gets adhered and uh, ex the glycoprotein 2B3A on the molecule on the surface of the platelet gets exposed. Two platelets come contact in contact with each other and they form a large platelet plug a primary hemostatic plug. And this primary hemostatic plug is the best, best platform for the clotting. Why? Because it helps or brings a lots of tissue factor in the near vicinity of the blood vessel and tissue factor is the main tissue molecule responsible for your starting coagulation through extrinsic pathway. And it also helps in providing lots of factor 8, 5, fibrinogen, 11, they are present in or on the platelets. And there are some of the factors that are absent in platelet. So, those factors are being given to the circulation. So, now the process of coagulation will start. This process involves conversion of the liquid plasma in blood into semi-solid gel that is formation of a clot. And the simplest scheme of coagulation can be summarized like stage 1 that is surface activation, participation of the platelet through platelet membrane phospholipid release and thromboplastin formation. Stage 2 conversion of prothrombin into thrombin. 3 conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin and stabilization of the clot. So, this whole mechanism of the coagulation pathway has been described very nicely by 
uh, Dr. Davy and Ratnoff and McFarland. So they proposed the waterfall pattern and the cascade model of coagulation. And this cascade model of coagulation actually divides the coagulation activation process into pathway or pathways into three parts. One is an intrinsic pathway, one is extrinsic pathway, one is a common pathway. And you are all very well, uh, well versed with these pathways. But why these pathways are important? Because this pathway actually reflects the in vitro testing. In vitro, how do we test coagulation? By doing a PT testing and APTT testing. If you think of intrinsic pathway, which involves factor 12, factor 11, 9, 8, and the common pathway like factor 5, 10, thrombin, and fibrinogen, these factor pathway is being governed by the activated partial thromboplastin time testing APTT. Similarly, if you look into the PT, usefulness of PT, PT is governing the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway defect. The extrinsic pathway involves your tissue factor and factor 7 and the common pathway again is factor 5, 10, thrombin, fibrinogen and whenever there is a defect in these, it can be reflected by your prolongation and the PT or prothrombin time. But this classical coagulation cascade, what have been observed cannot explain some of the abnormalities. For an example, if factor 12 is essential for hemostasis, then the people with the factor 12 deficiency usually do not bleed. So there is a question mark over there. So they ideally they should bleed, but they do not. We have seen that there can be isolated prolongation of APTT because of the factor 12 deficiency and there is no bleeding manifestation. Factor 11 is the only way to activate factor 9. But uh, we have seen that almost 50% of the people with factor 11 deficiency, they may not bleed. So is there any alternative pathway is there that uh, can forego the factor 11 defect? And if extrinsic and intrinsic pathway can independently produce thrombin, so why people with factor 8 or factor 9 deficiency bleed? So they should compensate by an overactivation of the extrinsic pathway. Because of these questions, uh, the model of cascade may not hold, hold good. So it is only reflective of what is happening in vitro, not in vivo, not inside the body. So that's the reason our cell-based model of hemostasis has been proposed. And this model has three phases. First is initiation and amplification. So what is initiation and amplification? Usually there is some amount of factor 7 uh, as an activated factor 7 circulates in the blood. And whenever there is an exposed endothelium, it exposes the tissue factor and more and more of factor 7 is activated factor 7 is being generated. And this activated se factor 7 will lead to activation of the factor 10 to activate factor 10A and the 10A is supplemented by the activated 5 and they will form a prothrombinase complex that will convert the prothrombin into thrombin. And now this thrombin will again activates the platelet causing activated platelet which makes a flippage and floppage mechanism what I have extra described before to uh, bring the factor 2B, 3A into the outer surface and now all other factors are getting gradually activated and this uh, process leads to the next phase that is the propagation. So what happens in the propagation? This activated platelet with factor 11, act activated factor 11 on the surface, activated factor 8 on the surface and activated factor 5A is on the surface. So what happens? Now 9 which is circulating in the blood will form an activated 9A by the action of the activated factor 11. And this activated 9A and 8A together forms the complex known as TN H complex and 10H complex will activate factor 10 into factor 10A and now 10A and 5A will come together to form a complex known as prothrombinase complex and this prothrombinase complex will now is now going to convert prothrombin into thrombin and the thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin and rest you know the downstream reactions and once this fibrin they will do a uh, fibrin uh, mess work around the activated platelets and this fibrin is getting stabilized by the factor 13. 
Now, once the platelet, fibrin, and fibrin stabilizing molecule factor 13, they form a stable clot, the anti clot mechanism will come into play. And that starts the process of termination. So, how the process of termination will start? There are tissue plasminogen activators are there that are going to convert the plasminogen into plasmin and this plasmin will go and degrade the fibrin to fibrin degradation products, the smaller molecules. Similarly, thrombomodulin is there that will convert the prothrombin, a thrombin into prothrombin by the action of the protein C to form activated protein C where protein S acts as a cofactor. Now, they will also act on the factor 10, that is tissue factor pathway inhibitor to form an uh, inactive factor 10. Similarly, antithrombin will act on factor 10 to form inactive factor 10. And the same action is being, uh, uh, being simulated by your unfractionated heparin, low molecular heparin or fondoparinox. So, with this, you have understood that there are three kinds of uh, coagulation proteins are there in the circulation. They can be classified into either the procoagulants or the anticoagulants or fibrinolytics. The procoagulants help in formation of the clot. Anticoagulants prevent clot formation. Fibrinolysis helps in lysis of the fibrin products. These procoagulants, again, all these proteins can be coming from or synthesized by the liver or they can be a non-hepatic uh, source. So, what are the factors that comes from the synthesis of the liver is that factor 1, 2, prothrombin, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11, 12. 8 that is a star mark because major, majority of the 8 can come from the endothelial cells, sino hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells, not the hepatocytes. Non-hepatic, mostly the factor 8 and the von Willebrand factor, the platelets and antiphospholipid antibodies. Anticoagulants include uh, hepatic synthesis like protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, but tissue factor pathway is a non-hepatic source. Similarly, fibrinolysis from hepatic source is by plasminogen and plasmine. So, with this, we have few things in our mind is that a cell-based model that, wa uh, that is more explainable for what is happening in vivo. Number two, there are procoagulants, anticoagulants and fibrinolytics are there. They can be either synthesized from the liver or they can have non-hepatic sources of synthesis. And all these actually maintain a hemostatic balance. So that is the balance between the procoagulant factors and the anticoagulant factors responsible for normal hemostasis. And what happens in uh, liver diseases? Liver diseases, we have observed that uh, there happens to be both thrombosis and bleeding. So, coagulation disorders are an integral component of the liver disease. Bleeding issues have been dominant clinical problem, but inappropriate clotting has also been recognized in cases of liver disease patients. And all these can be attributed to changes in hemostatic balance. For example, if there is a reduction in the procoagulation factors, they will lead to more of more of uh, bleeding. If there is a reduction in the anticoagulant factors, there is chance of more of thrombosis. So that's what is being seen in case of liver diseases. Both the entities, whether hypercoagulability and hyper hypocoagulability leading to bleeding complications can be seen in case of liver disease. So, what happens if there is a hypercoagulability or clotting complications? It can lead to more of intrahepatic microthrombosis or portal vein thrombosis or peripheral venous thromboembolism like a DVT. Why there is intrahepatic microthrombosis? Because there are small vessel thrombosis that can promote fibrosis and progression and that can lead to the organ atrophy that is parenchymal extinction will be there and a lot of randomized clinical trial is required to look into the therapeutic options. Similarly, variable clinical presentation can be seen in case of a portal vein thrombosis and one of the major risk factors are thrombophilia, prior venous thromboembolism. There is a slow flow in the portal vein malignancies, intra-abdominal infection or any recent interventional uh, can also increase the portal vein thrombosis and 
looking into the peripheral venous thrombosis there can be risk in hospitalized cirrhotic patients than in comparison to the non cirrhotic patients and we can use prophylaxis in case of cirrhosis which is less commonly known in care in comparison to non cirrhotic patients looking at hypocoagulability or bleeding complications there can be portal hypertension related bleeding like bleeding events uh, uh, are leading to the hemostatic failure but uh, mostly the bleeding complications leading to the portal hypertension are not because of the hemostatic failure but because of a esophageal gastric or ectopericial bleeding or there can be a hemostatic failure that can lead to accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis like AICF or premature clot dissolution and hyperfibrinolysis they are very clinically similar to the clinically similar to the DIC but only thing is that the major difference between DIC and a hepatic coagulopathy in a laboratory test uh, you will not find a reduction in factor 8 levels in case of a hepatic coagulopathy but you will see pan hypocoagulation in case of dic patients so bleeding in liver disease can be broadly divided into two categories one is portal pressure driven number two alteration in hemostasis and in alteration in hemostasis that can be more of a mucosal or puncture wound bleeding will be more common whereas portal pressure driven there will be variceal bleeding is more common and what happens in alteration in hemostasis sir? Uh, there will be a lot of premature uh, clot uh, formation clot dissolution or hyperfibrinolysis and that is being known as aicf so what is aicf accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis coming to the alterations in hemostasis as i have told it can be because of a primary hemostatic alteration secondary hemostatic alteration or it, uh, tertiary hemostatic, hemostatic alteration of the fibrinolytic pathways in the primary hemostatic alteration you can observe two things that can be a thrombocytopenia or there can be a dysfunctional platelet so both can lead to bleeding manifestation so why there is thrombocytopenia the thrombocytopenia is because of a splenomegaly which is sequestering a lot of platelet or you can say hypersplenism there is also reduced production of thrombopoietin because thrombopoietin is being synthesized or produced by the liver and liver is not functional the platelets have also a reduced half life there can be an autoimmune destruction of the platelet especially in hepatitis c and primary biliary cirrhosis patients there can be a low grade dic platelet consumption related to cirrhosis related hypercoagulability or there can be a bone marrow suppression so these conditions lead to mostly to a mild or moderate thrombocytopenia severe thrombocytopenia is usually unusual uh, in case of liver diseases but if they are being seen they can be a trigger for a bleeding manifestation similarly coming to the platelet functional defect is also uh, seen in case of liver diseases that can be an acquired storage pool disease or there can be reduced production of arachidonic acid increased fibrinolysis increased nitric oxide or prostacyclin synthesis or reduced hematocrit so all these lead to a dysfunctional platelet and these are the two primary hemostatic defect that is being seen in hemostasis so does it mean that whenever there is a dysfunctional platelet and there are the uh, reduced platelet count it should lead to bleeding manifestation but it is not true so what is being observed is that thrombin generation in patients with cirrhosis is almost very similar in comparison to the control in in the presence of thrombomodulin so this graph or cartoon is presenting the endogenous thrombin potential so that is the area under the thrombin potential curve uh, that is the amount of the thrombin that is being generated if you look into the control and cirrhosis without thrombomodulin you can see that uh, there is a reduced endogenous thrombin potential but reduced thrombin generation in cirrhosis but with addition of thrombomodulin the thrombin that is being produced are not significantly different between the control and the cirrhotic patients so actually the platelet uh, is or has acquired some extra things or there is some extra things are there in the circulation or uh, 
uh, that is helping the platelets uh, uh, to become learner uh, to not to show that much of bleeding manifestations so coming to uh, let's understand what is thrombin generation or what is a thrombin generation test this thrombin generation test is uh, more of a research test uh, is not uh, usually available uh, in all places but it is a real time test that looks into thrombin generation it quantifies the thrombin generated when clotting is stimulated and this thrombin generated will produce a fluorescent signal by acting on a substrate instead of forming a clot and what initiate the thrombin generation the thrombin generation is being initiated by the tissue factor okay and there are different parameters that uh, we look into a, a, in a thrombin generation test one is a lag time so lag time is the time in minutes from the start of the assay to the initial generation of the thrombin the moment at which the thrombin is getting formed so this is your lag time the peak height is the maximum thrombin concentration that uh, that uh, that is king getting achieved is the peak height and there is a major term or most important terminology is endogenous thrombin potential it is the area under the curve expressed in nano mole per liter of thrombin and there is a time to peak in thrombin generation is the time in minutes required to reach maximum thrombin generation and the start of the tell is the time at which thrombin generation has come to an end so as you can see a or i can ask you what is the major uh, molecule that is being produced in a coagulation process it is the thrombin so that is the rate limiting step in a coagulation formation so if you measure this molecule the amount of the molecule that is being produced it may represent uh, a better clotting potential what is happening in vivo okay so that is the reason why so much of interest around the endogenous thrombin potential measurement and uh, comparison between the control and cirrhotic group to show that the endogenous thrombin potential among the cirrhotic patient does not differ much from the control population similarly uh, when we look into the plasma from patients with cirrhosis uh, to understand the, how the platelets are adhering in comparison to the normal plasma in this picture you can see the control platelet with the control plasma the uh, the surface being formed are smaller in size but when you are adding control platelet with the cirrhotic plasma the amount of the platelet that uh, forms adhesion is getting increased similarly when you are using a cirrhosis platelets with a control plasma the amount of the platelet activation is not that great but when cirrhotic platelet with the cirrhotic plasma you can see that so lots of platelet adhesions are being formed so what does it indicate is that the platelet adhesion potential in a cirrhotic patient is more than the platelet adhesion potential in comparison to the control population so that means platelets are hyper functional in nature and why the platelets are hyper functional in case of cirrhosis may be possibly it is triggered by the oxidant stress what are the things we also observe in case of uh, patients with uh, chronic liver disease it is being observed that the von willebrand factor antigen levels are substantially elevated in cirrhosis and acute liver failure second there is a substantial elevation of the von willebrand factor recov levels means von willebrand factor activity levels but there is a depressed von willebrand recov to antigen ratio in cirrhosis and acute liver failure third there is a reduced collagen binding capacity of the von willebrand factor patient with cirrhosis or acute liver failure fourth adam t is 13 activity and antigen levels are highly variable but mostly they are reduced in quantity and there is reduced uh, reduction in high molecular weight von willebrand factor multimer in the plasma from patients with liver disease so that means more, most of the multimers are being reduced in quantity and the plasma from the patient of cirrhosis also support von willebrand factor dependent platelet adhesion and that is better in comparison to the normal plasma and von willebrand factor pro, pro, pro peptide levels are substantially elevated in case of a 
chronic liver disease. So that indicates more and more of von Willebrand factor are getting synthesized. With these observations, uh, we will try to understand what is the role of ADAMTS13 in case in a normal scenario. As you know, this ADAMTS13 is a disintegrin and metalloproteinase with a thrombospondin type 1 motif that is a member 13. And this molecule actually cleaves the von Willebrand factor into smaller molecules. So, may they try to make the von Willebrand factor non-functional and uh, what is being absorbed in case of chronic or acute liver failure, you can see the ADAMTS13 labels whether it is activity or antigen they are getting gradually reduced in case of uh, cirrhosis or chronic hepatitis and depending upon the severity of the cirrhosis the label of ADAMTS13 is also proportionately reduced. More the severe cirrhosis, less is the ADAMTS13 level. Similarly, the ADAMTS13 levels are also reduced in case of acute liver injury or acute liver failure in comparison to the control population. So, there is now a misbalance between high von Willebrand factor and a low ADAMTS13. And what does its implication is that if ADAMTS13 activity is uh, reduced, more the reduction, it will show significantly more number of orthotopic liver transplant or mortality in case of a liver failure. Similarly, this activity is also indicates the significantly, it indicates the gradation of the hepatic encopelopathy that is more severe than encopelopathy, less in the ADAMTS13 activity. So, it has a prognostic implications. So, that means reduced ADAMTS13 in acute liver failure is associated with a poor outcome. So, in primary hemostasis, what are the summary of finding you will observe? Thrombocytopenia. Number 2, platelet can be dysfunctional in nature. Number 3, you will find a high von Willebrand factor but a low ADAMTS13. We will come how this interaction is actually helping primary hemostasis. Coming to the alteration in the hemostasis in the secondary hemostasis that is coagulation. In liver diseases, you will find that there is reduction in the synthesis of procoagulant protein like factor 2, 5, 7, 9, 10 and 11 except factor 8. So, that is the distinguishing point between or differentiating point between a liver failure or coagulopathy versus a DIC. And these clotting factor labels usually fall in parallel with the progression of the liver disease, but there is a considerable variation how much will uh, fall will happen in different factors. So, what does it mean that you may not find that there is a proportionate decrease in factor 2 and factor 5 together. There it may happen that factor factor 2 is more reduced in comparison to the factor 5. Similarly, fibrinogen levels are normal or increased in stable cirrhosis. Only when there is a hepatic failure, the fibrinogen will go more down, will be reduced in quantity. But the major finding that is being found in case of a chronic liver disease is that there is an acquired dysfibrinogenemia in almost 50 to 78 percent of the patients. Why this dysfibrinogenemia will happen? Because the regenerating hepatocytes synthesize an abnormal fibrinogen with increased sialic acid residues which impair the polymerization of the fibrin monomers. So, that is the reason there is a dysfibrinogenemia. And factor 8 labels are usually increased several fold in stable cirrhosis. It can result from increased synthesis in response to a cytokine release from necrotic tissue or reduced clearance due to impaired hepatic expression of the low density lipoprotein receptor or stabilization by a high level of von Willebrand factor because von Willebrand factor is the carrier molecule of factor 8. So, that is the reason factor 8 levels can be increased several fold in a stable cirrhosis. And uh, when we looked into the endogenous thrombin potential in the cirrhosis cirrhotic patients, uh, it is being found that despite abnormal conventional coagulation test, the endogenous thrombin potential in cirrhosis is very similar to or same as that of a normal person.
and if you look into the thrombin generation without thrombomodulin there is a significant difference no but no difference is absorbed in cirrhotic patient and healthy volunteers with thrombomodulin so the thrombin generation potential are almost similar at between a cirrhotic patients and a healthy volunteer one thing we have to remember over here is that cirrhotic patients are resistant to active protein c that means there is an activated protein c resistance which can lead to more of thrombosis what else we can see is that if we compare the endogenous thrombin potential between the control and the patient and the patient who is having all the coagulation factors below the uh, set normal range that is suppose factor 8 is 5% factor 5 factor 7 is 5% factor 5 is 15% protein c 5% anti thrombin 35% and an inr pt inr is 3 still the endogenous thrombin potential is same like that of the control population so there is no significant difference between the thrombin that is being generated in a stable liver failure patient uh, versus a control pair person coming to the alteration in hemostasis into the anticoagulation these natural anticoagulant protein labels they fall progressively with increasing severity of the liver disease So who are they? The antithrombin, protein C, protein S, and their range from 10 to 65 percent of the normal, similar to the range of the values found in patients with inherited F. That means they are more; they will lead to more of coagulation formation or the clot formation, or the, they will lead to pro-thrombotic states. Tissue factor pathway inhibitor is not synthesized by the liver or hepatocytes they are more synthesized by the endothelial cells and it is observed that the tapi labels are normal or elevated in patients with chronic liver disease and the tapi anticoagulant pathway is functionally impaired because it depends upon the protein s and the protein s is actually low so so the tapi becomes so uh, functionally impaired or they become down regulated uh, as far as the thrombin generation uh, is being concerned so all the pro and anti fibrinolytic proteins in case of uh, liver failure are synthesized by the liver except tissue plasminogen activator and uh, uh, your pii1 which are synthesized by your endothelial cell and the label of plasminogen anti plasmin and thrombin activated fibrinolysis inhibitor or tafi and factor 13 labels are reduced in chronic liver disease but the plasma label of tissue plasminogen activator or pi1 labels are variable may be normal or increased so that indicates fibrinolytic activity can be variable between individuals acidic fluid plays a major role in cirrhosis as far as the fibrinolytic activity is being concerned because they promote fibrino lysis so whenever there is a lots of reabsorption of the large volume of acidic fluid into the systemic circulation there can be an accelerated fibrino lysis so with this when we look into the fibrinolytic potential of the cirrhotic patients as you can see a the tafi lay is uh, more uh, and the fibrinolytic where which is being measured by your euglobulin lysis time or clot lysis time they are almost similar between control mild and moderate and severe disease so what you have observed is that when we look into the platelet though the count is uh, low there is a dysfunctional platelet but with thrombomodulin the amount of the thrombin that is being generated uh, uh, by the platelet is very similar to that of the control population looking into the secondary hemostatic pathway there are defect in coagulation factors but there is increase in uh, there are other coagulation factor like factor 8 and when we look into the again endogenous thrombin potential uh, between a control and a stable stable cirrhotic patient they are very similar there is no significant difference and the same is seen in also fibrinolysis uh, pathway so historically what we are believing is that change in hemostasis that occur in liver disease were assumed to reflect an acquired bleeding disorder but the classical interpretation of the coagulopathy of liver disease what it shows is actually a very balanced state uh, in a stable disease so the concept of 
uh, probe leading status has been replaced by a rebalanced hemostasis. So what is this rebalanced hemostasis uh, model? So according to this model, the hemostatic alteration that occurs result in a new balance within and between the procoagulant factors, the anticoagulant factors and the fibrinolytic system. And because of relative deficiency of the procoagulant anticoagulant factors, the hemostatic balance can be a more precarious condition and uh, if you can say it is uh, though it is a rebalance but it is an unstable rebalance. So whenever the stability is being disturbed by any way it can either tip towards a bleeding manifestation or uh, towards a thrombosis manifestation provoking a circumstantial risk factors. So better understand it is just like a weighing balance in a healthy individual there are procoagulants and anticoagulants they are balanced so there is uh, no bleeding or no thrombosis happens in vivo in a normal state but whenever there is increase in procoagulants or reduce it will cause thrombosis or whenever there is a reduction in anticoagulants it will cause thrombosis reduction in procoagulant can lead to bleeding manifestation the same way if you look into the liver disease again the balance is same so it is a balance between a procoagulant and the anticoagulant and it is very well balanced and this balance getting distorted by appearance of renal failure or infection or altered blood flow or endothelial activation etc so if both look same then what is the difference so this is the difference so when you look into the quantity of the procoagulant factors and anticoagulant factors in a normal hemostasis the quantity of those factors are reduced because of the liver disease but they are reduced simultaneously and proportionately so now they are also balanced so it is just like you are putting 5 kilo on both sides of the balance they here and 5 kilo on the other side of some rice or something so they will look equal if you put 500 gram they will also be balanced and they will be in the same label so that's what is happening in liver disease the procoagulant factors and anticoagulant factors are reduced but they are reduced proportionately and trying to balance each other and that is the reason why in a stable condition there is no bleeding or no increased bleeding or no increased thrombosis so to understand medically or scientifically so what is happening or what is rebalancing it suppose hemostatic changes that promote bleeding as you know is a thrombocytopenia and platelet functional defect and enhanced production of nitric oxide and prostacyclin so they form the path of primary hemostasis how it is rebalanced it is rebalanced by elevated levels of vonulepran factor and decreased level of adamts 13 which actually degrades the vonulepran factor Second, secondary hemostasis. So, what is the defect you see? You see that there are low levels of coagulation factor like factor 2, 5, uh, 7, 9, 10, 11. There is a vitamin K deficiency and there is a dysfunctional fibrinogen or dysfibrinogenemia. How it is balanced? It is balanced by elevated levels of factor 8 or decreased levels of protein C, protein S, antithrombin, alpha 2 microglobulin or heparin for factor 2 because they are synthesized by the liver. Coming to the fibrinolysis, what is the hemostatic defect that can promote bleeding is the low level of alpha 2 antiplasmin, factor 13, taffy and elevated level of tissue plasminogen activators. But how it is balanced? It is balanced by low levels of plasminogen. So you can see that one balancing act is that proportionate reduction in the procoagulant, anticoagulant and the fibrinolytic factors. Another rebalancing attitude is uh, the approach is that there is a change where some factors are getting reduced and some factors try to balance it by an increase in its level. But does this balance is quite stable? No. So as you can see the difference between uh, normal that is the A graph versus the B graph where rebalanced hemostasis where you can see that both the states are not actually same though they look very similar because there is a reduction in the absolute concentration of the different factors in uh, your chronic liver disease and it is just like you are trying your uh, an elephant is doing a circus 
with two legs in the front and the back legs are being raised so it is quite unstable anytime it can fall it can fall either way because it can fall either way it has a risk you can see that uh, liver disease patients can be presented like a bipolar what is the bipolar tendency in these patients sir? that it can either lead to bleeding or it can lead to thrombosis so that is the reason you can say the cirrhosis they are being called or the liver disease patients can you can say is that bloody guy which can go in either direction and you have to be skeptical about it and you try to manage both way so if you are trying to manage only bleeding maybe you are trying to create a procoagulant state or more of coagulation if you are trying to manage the thrombosis you may be there is a more of bleeding manifestation that is the situation that is being faced in case of a liver disease so there is a better depiction is that yeah you are standing on a flat platform where the there is a stone is there that is a rounded in yeah, or there is a oh, ball like structure so where you can fall on either direction in case of chronic liver disease so what makes them to fall to either direction if there is a renal failure or infection that can lead to more of bleeding manifestation if there is an altered blood flow or endothelial activation that can lead to the more of thrombosis so that is a patient with cirrhosis then all this coagulation uh, abnormalities can be diagnosed or can be indicated by certain laboratory test and when we look or when we think which is widely available test is a pt inr and the aptt but problem is that they do not reflect the derangement in hemostasis in liver disease they do not reliably predict the risk of bleeding and there is no evidence that a prolonged pt or inr predicts bleeding at the time of invasive diagnostic procedure and that is the reason why the american association of the study of liver diseases practice guideline for liver biopsy acknowledges that there is no specific pt inr cutoff at or above which bleeding complications can be reliably predicted so pt inr is not going to predict you the bleeding risk in a chronic liver disease patients why we will try to understand the the when we talk about inr inr is your international normalized ratio and why it is developed it is developed for standardization of the pt reporting for patients on stable anticoagulation with vitamin k antagonist or bka or warfarin so you need to take home message is that pt inr has been standardized only for monitoring the vitamin k antagonist therapy it is not validated for patients with liver disease and how it is calculated is actually calculated from a pt ratio that is adjusted for the international sensitivity index that is isi and the isi here reflects actually the sensitivity of a particular thromboplastin reagent because pt contains different different pt reagents contain different type of thromboplastin reagent and uh, to a particular level of reduction and the vitamin k dependent clotting factor and it's usually derived from the cohort of patients on stable vitamin k anticoagulants but patients with chronic liver disease have a more complex and less predictable coagulation profile than patients on warfarin with similar inr values and that is the reason there is a substantial interlaboratory variability you can see because different thromboplastin will have different sensitivity with two different cirrhotic patients and there can be an interlaboratory variability largely due to difference in the reagent and the instrument that is being used or the methodology that is being used that is the reason why an alternative inr system has been proposed for patients with liver disease to standardize the reporting where the calibration of the isi is done using the plasma sample from patients with the stable liver disease patients so that is known as isi liver but problem is that this is not widely available lots of work need to be done on this uh, uh, platform that is isi liver only when it will come into uh, the wide scale laboratory use maybe during that uh, time uh, we can predict or pt inr liver 
will can predict a bleeding risk well so uh, what is the other strategy that can be used we can propose only one type of thromboplastin that can be used so that similar isi values uh, can be applicable to all the laboratory so that is a proposal that can be used to bring standardization in reporting of the pt inr in liver disease coming to the platelet count when we think of the platelet count platelet count is a better predictor of the bleeding in comparison to the inr and it has been observed that a platelet count of 50 to 60000 is associated with significant increase post procedure bleeding and the threshold of platelet count below which the bleeding this clearly increases has not been defined till yet so that can be requirement of lot of clinical trial to uh, to actually fix a threshold but yes 50000 can be a threshold where, where when you can go for a prophylactic transfusion but if you think of a very strict criteria maybe a 30000 or 25000 maybe a better cut off coming to what are the tests that is being done and what are these limitations when we look into platelet count the threshold prediction of the bleeding are not defined and it does not reflect the platelet function so we have already observed that uh, uh, during our previous slide coming to the inr it measures only the procoagulant system it is not uh, measuring the anticoagulation system there can be a lot of interlaboratory variation in patients with chronic liver disease and it is not validated in chronic liver disease ptt or aptt it measures only the procoagulant system again and usually does not reflect the severity of the liver disease and the prolongation of ptt may be blunted by high level of the factor 8 levels seen in case of chronic liver disease procoagulant factor levels not as widely available there is a substantial laboratory variation and there is no clear relationship between bleeding in cld patients with different procoagulant factor levels doing a platelet aggregation study is only available in a specialized lab they are not calibrated for thrombocytopenia they must be performed uh, within 4 uh, hours of blood sampling and they correlate poorly with the bleeding manifestation thrombin generation test is uh, one of the global hemostatic test again it is not widely available it is too complicated for routine use and addition of thromboplastin is also not standardized coming to the another the global hemostasis thromboelastography so you can say this test though widely not available and most parameters are not yet properly standardized but its use has been tremendously increased in liver transplant so when we look in uh, when you are being asked to indicate only one coagulation test or a group of coagulation tests which can better predict the hemostatic abnormality liver disease maybe we don't have an answer and the major problem with this uh, test like a pt inr or the platelet count they are predicting only the procoagulant system they are not predicting the anticoagulation system because of which there is a need for a global test so why there is a global test which is being required in hemostasis is convinced on coagulation test like pt inr or aptt measure the procoagulant factors they do not reflect the reduction in the anticoagulant factor the complex interaction between the cell and coagulation factor in the whole blood because you are separating the plasma the pt inr or aptt also do not measure the clot strength and the stability because it is not looking into the fibrinolytic or fibrin stabilization process similarly in contrast if you compare a global test if it is available which can indicate number 1 all the interaction between a procoagulant factors and the anticoagulant factors the interaction between the cell and the coagulation factor and the post clot formation that is the stability of the clot and the fibrinolytic pathway those kind of test ideally can indicate the hemostatic abnormality more in in a, a liver disease patient so that's the reason the global coagulation assess system has been developed and this global coagulation assess system basically have currently we have two common uh, instruments or common types of test that is available one is a thrombin generation test 
which dynamically measures the total amount of thrombin that is generated during an in vitro coagulation but this is uh, uh, not widely available and uh, most of these thrombin generation tests are of research use. Next is thromboelastography or TEC or thromboelastometry or ROTEM. These are two commercially available global tests which look at uh, which are viscoelastic tests for hemostasis which reflects the interaction between the plasma platelet and the blood states. So what are these tests? They are being performed by these two into instruments. So the this is a TEG which is developed in 1950, around 1950 and the ROTEM which has been developed uh, around two decades back. So if you see in TEG there is a pin and there is a cuvet. In ROTEM there is also pin and cuvet. But what happens in TEG? The pin is stable, the cuvet is rotating. In ROTEM the pin is rotating, the cuvet is static and they generate a graph that is viscoelastic uh, uh, tracing of the viscoelastic strength and this graph looks like this and there are different parameters in it that is a k by teg which is equal uh, sorry r by teg which is equivalent to the clotting time in rotem k by teg which is equivalent to cft the alpha angle maximum amplitude these are very same in the both the instruments so what actually is happening is that there is a cup with the blood that oscillates and the pin is suspended and the torsion where it attaches to it and it measures the torque or the rotation that is transmitted from the immersed pin after the fibrin platelet bonding has been started in case of a take rotem what happens there is a mirror is there and the uh, it uh, looks into the light that is being reflected from there and uh, it uh, uh, elaborates the tracing. So there is a clot activation process that is done by the tissue factor at physiological level. Uh, by addition of this clot activation, the clot starts forming. To form the clot, uh, there is a clot, the, the formation of the time required to form the clot is the clotting time. The rate of clotting time is indicated by the clot formation time and the alpha angle. The clot strength is indicated by the maximum amplitude or the maximum clot firmness and the clot lysis by maximum lysis. But the rotem which is being very commonly being used uh, can use specific activators to further identify specific defect in hemostasis. So what are they? Suppose XTEM. XTEM is very similar to the extrinsic pathway where we are using some tissue factor to activate the extrinsic pathway. INTEM. INTEM is using some contact activator such as partial thromboplastin phospholipid to activate the intrinsic pathway which is simil very similar to the uh, in intrinsic pathway in the coagulation system. Fifteen. So in fifteen, what is being done is that in addition to the tissue factor a platelet inhibitor like a cytocalacin is being added. So whatever the impact is there the impact is because of the fibrinogen alone. So when we are trying to nullify the impact of the platelet and look into whether fibrinogen is uh, defective or quantity is less we can run at 15. Another modality is there aptame where the, in addition to the tissue factor an antifibrinolytic that is aproteinin is being added which detects the excessive fibrinolysis. Heptame similarly nullifies the impact of the heparin. So coming here to oh, different examples, uh, the, the clotting time actually is start of the clot. So it indicates coagulation factor deficiency. So whenever the clotting time is prolonged, so there is a coagulation factor is reduced or there is a deficiency of the coagulation factor. Second is CFT, clot formation time is contributed mostly by the three factors. One is platelet, next is fibrinogen and the factor, the factor 13. So whenever CFT is uh, reduced, increased, increase in clot formation time, there can be because of the reduction in the platelet count or the platelet function or reduction in the fibrinogen level. The alpha angle, whenever it is reduced, again it indicates the impact of the low platelet or the low fibrinogen. The maximum clot firmness also indicates the low platelet or low fibrinogen. Similar lysis, maximum lysis indicates deficiency of fibrinolytic pathway or the deficiency of fibrin stabilizing molecule. As you can see in this case, the clot, the clotting time CT is prolonged, the CFT is prolonged, the alpha angle is reduced, the maximum clot firmness is reduced. So it indicates a state of hypocoagulability.
looking into the second example you can see the clotting time is prolonged and the clot formation time is mild prolonged with a normal alpha angle but the lysis index is high or maximum lysis is high so which indicates the cause is primary fibrinolysis and these cases sir the guideline says that you should put antifibrinolytics first followed by your factors whatever replacement you need to do so you can see the fibrinolysis is corrected by addition of a tranexamic acid so the lysis here has uh, lysis index has been increased or maximum lysis has been reduced this is a case where the hypofibrinogen or the fibrinogens have been reduced so that's the reason the cft is prolonged and alpha angle is reduced look into the platelet count they may be normal that indicates the fibrinogen is low do a fibrinogen uh, assay you will find hypofibrinogenemia so is there any alternative in our routine coagulation testing or routine coagulometer where we can really indicate something like into a global hemostasis platform or global hemostasis testing some way the clot waveform analysis depicts a global hemostasis in a routine coagulation testing so we have done a so this clot waveform parameters are there number 1 the clotting time so it is the time taken for the plasma of for initial fibrin formation after the addition of calcium chloride but what is the waveform indicates is the mean 1 mean 2 and max 2 so mean 1 is the maximal change in the rate of light signal that is the velocity at which speed the clot is getting formed and mean 2 is the maximal change in the magnitude of the light signal that is the acceleration and max 2 is the maximal coagulation deceleration so if you look into a clot waveform analysis it is the kinetic uh, representation of the formation of the clot maybe this can assess the global hemostasis uh, or this can reflect a global hemostasis in a better way than isolated clotting time so for which we have done a study and we have found that uh, there is a significant difference of pt mean 1 and time to maximum velocity mean 2 time to maximum acceleration etc in a normal and cld patients but when we compared the uh, the the uh, pt and the clot waveform analysis among bleeder and non bleeder there is a significant difference between the maximum velocity maximum acceleration and maximum deceleration uh, between both bleeders and the non bleeder patient so what we have learned is that it's time to look beyond the routine test into global hemostasis we have to move ahead from the conventional approach and maybe this looking into the global hemostasis can better guide us uh, regarding the transfusion where we can avoid unnecessary transfusions so how we can prevent bleeding in case of a cld patient so the again the guidelines uh, study literature is ambiguous regarding that some uh, studies say that vitamin k supplementation may correct the abnormal coagulation test in patients with high risk of deficiency due to biliary disease or got sterilization of the broad spectrum antibiotic specifically but in cirrhotic patients with reduced synthetic function the benefit of vitamin k is uncertain maybe a minimal improvement of pt and ptt in patients with cirrhosis and it has been observed that cirrhotic patient had normal pip pipka level that is protein induced by vitamin k absence so that suggests vitamin k deficiency actually does not play a major role in coagulopathy in liver disease unless until there is a, a gut sterilization is happening or a biliary disease is there ffp transfusion of ffp has minimal impact on mildly prolonged inr and prophylactic transfusion of ffp prior to an invasive procedure is unlikely to have any clinical benefit so don't transfuse prophylactically ffp just looking at a, a prolong uh, uh, at an increase inr value platelet similarly have a severe thrombocytopenia may limit thrombin generation in patients with cirrhosis and support common platelet count threshold of 50000 for a high risk procedure you can do a platelet prophylactic platelet transfusion otherwise if there is an elective pro the process is there another choice is the thrombopoietin receptor agonist like a eltromopac or avatromopac uh, etc but the problem with those agents are that uh, the thrombotic complications are being increased 
and they reflect this because there is a disruption of the rebalanced hemostasis by a rapid sustained increase in the activated platelet count because of a thrombopoietin receptor agonist so what you have learned is that prevention with the bleeding should not be aimed at correcting abnormal routine coagulation test like a pt inr or epitt and what will happen if you try to correct an abnormal routine coagulation test in a liver disease is that there can be a large volume of ffp that is required to significantly increase the clotting factor levels and because of this large volume they will lead to volume overload and volume overload will lead to exacerbation of the portal hypertension so that can lead further increasing the bleeding risk paradoxically similarly prophylactic infusion of ppp also delay the procedure and expose the patient to unnecessary risk that is risk associated with transfusion risk associated with a, a transfusion transmitted infection and these are expensive so do not do a prevention with the bleeding based on just a pt inr so what should you do prior to an invasive procedure look into the bleeding history consider infection or renal failure is there or not pt inr does not predict bleeding so prophylactic plasma transfusion is not indicated a minimal platelet count may be required but prophylactic transfusion is probably not indicated and you have to wait and see perhaps unless bleeding may result in any irreversible damage and one has to avoid the fluid overload coming to the management of the active bleeding bleeding complications in chronic liver diseases are infrequently related to abnormal hemostasis the majority of the clinically significant bleeding episode are due rather due because of an increased portal pressure rather than a deranged hemostasis but yes sir, there can be a risk factor for variceal bleeding are primarily related to hemodynamic and mechanical factors like portal pressure and varic size and if you try to balance or manage the active bleeding that is happening because of a variceal bleeding there is a rebalanced hemostasis in patient which will be a, which will uh, be made unstable and may tip towards either hemorrhage by several trigger including corner uh, or may trigger lead towards the thrombosis but uh, you as you can uh, understand this rebalance can become unstable in a in specific scenarios where the bleeding is because of an hemostatic disorder or hemostatic condition uh, abnormal hemostatic condition it specifically in case of a renal failure and infection so what are the potential trigger for bleeding in chronic liver disease it can be the hemodynamic or mechanical factor because of a portal hypertension or local vascular abnormalities so you need not worry for a factor replacement or the transfusion etc it can be because of a renal failure which cause platelet dysfunction abnormal platelet vessel wall interaction or anemia so you have to think of a replacement bacterial infection can be because of increased nitric oxide and prostacyclin that inhibiting the platelet or increased release of endogenous heparinoids that impair the coagulation so renal failure usually develop as a part of end stage liver disease resulting in bleeding tendency due to acquired platelet dysfunction and abnormal endothelial function bacterial infection they act as a trigger for variceal bleeding are associated with failure to control the bleeding and bacterial endotoxin induced nitric oxide and prostacyclin can also impair the platelet aggregation endotoxin may also release endogenous heparinoids the glycosaminoglycans that can maintain the physiologic antithrombotic surface on the endothelium that lead to the more of bleeding manifestation so how do we manage active bleeding that can be a standard treatment for active variceal hemorrhage that include combination of vasoconstrictor endoscopic therapy transfusion resuscitation with the red cell transfusion the threshold uh, uh, for target is can be a 7 to 8 platelet transfusion target can be 50000 cryoprecipitate can be given to maintain a fibrinogen more than 100 recombinant factor 8 is not approved in case of liver disease but off label use have shown that increased risk of atrial thrombocytopenia so please refrain from use of recombinant factor 7 you have to balance or you have to assess the clinical risk before using a recombinant factor 
Instead, you can use a prothrombin complex concentrate, which are plasma derived product that contain vitamin K dependent coagulation factor and anticoagulation protein like protein C and S. So, there is a balance between a procoagulant and anticoagulant proteins. There are two type of PCCs available one is a three factor, which is usually low concentration of factor 7 and little or no factor protein C or protein S, or four factor PCC that contain both adequate amounts of the both the factors. So, is a four factor PCC is usually recommended. But PCC can also increase your thrombotic risk in patients with liver disease. So, you need to be really careful when you are using PCC. Desmopressin, it has minimal hemostatic benefit in cirrhotic patients because already there is a high elevated level of vonulipidin factor and factor 8 is present. So, you are just going to increasing the vonulipidin factor more. So, that is the reason it has a minimal. So, may not be usually indicated. Antifibrinolytic agents, yes, they have shown to reduce the blood loss during liver transplant, but there is inadequate evidence of benefit outside the transplant setting. So, what actually happens in liver transplant as far as the transfusion practice is being concerned? Traditionally, we are actually looking into the perioperative bleeding complications where a major concern was liver transplant and it has been observed that transfusion rate of 500 consecutive liver transplant uh, yeah, the mean level of 0 0.5 or 1.3 RBC unit are transfused per patient for 500 uh, orthotopic liver transplant that has been performed. And 79.6% of the patient did not receive any blood products. So, what uh, you have understood that coagulation defects do not predict blood product requirement during liver transplant. So, there is a no link between coagulation defect and bleeding or RBC or plasma transfusion. It is neither useful nor necessary to correct the coagulation defect with plasma transfusion before a liver transplant. Then how do you manage bleeding and transfusion during liver transplant? The pre-2010 era, the, there is a lot of uh, study which uh, looked into other aspects, but once the Rotem came into play uh, the during this 2012, 13 and forward, the focus has been changed into Rotem best transfusion management. And how does this Rotem best transfusion management is going to help you out? So, if you think of a liver transplant, that is a baseline uh, hemostatic uh, uh, potential that uh, you will assess and the liver will be removed. So, it goes to a stage of an hepatic. Then the liver is transplanted, so there is a new hepatic reperfusion and uh, the prior to the transport of the ICU, so the, you have to assess the hemostatic potential. So these are the suggested timelines when you should check the hemostatic potential through a rotem. Okay, And you should also optimize before the transfusion the surgical bleeding through all other parameters like calcium, hemoglobin, the pH, etc. Suta and temperature should be monitored and should be corrected. Once you know during this time period, you can obtain the rotem. You can use extem, intem, fiftem, heptem, etc. Platelet count, INR and fibrinogen level. If your INR is more than 1.8 or the clotting time in extem is more than 90 seconds, so that indicates an extrinsic pathway defect. So, there is a clotting factor dysfunction is there. Recommendation in the OEO State University of Liver Transfusion Guideline is transfuse 4 units of FMP. Suppose there is a post uh, reperfusion, you are looking into the activated clotting time because you are using heparin, so there should not be any thrombosis. More than 20% of the baseline, the activated clotting time or the clotting time in, uh, in, uh, 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 in tame or the heptame is more than 20%. So, there is still residual heparin effect is there. You have to nullify the heparin effect. One has to inject IV protamine 25 to 50 milligram in increment doses. If you look into the maximum clot firmness in extem, which is less than 50 or the platelet count is less than 50,000, that indicates platelet dysfunction. So, recommendation is that give platelet transfusion during liver transplant. Similarly, you can look into the fibrinogen, which is less than 150 and maximum clot firmness in 15 is less than 10. So, that indicates fibrinogen is either dysfunctional or there is a hypofibrinogenemia or afibrinogenemia. You have to transfuse cryoprecipitate. If you look into the maximum lysis more than 15 percent, so that is uh, fibrinolysis, hyperfibrinolysis is there. So, you can correct hyperfibrinolysis by giving antifibrinolytics like aminocaproic acid 2 gram IV. So, simple theory is simple. 
look into the clotting time clotting time indicates your coagulation factor deficiencies and your clotting time if it is prolonged or increased more than 90 second in an extent you have to give clotting factors as a replacement during a liver transplant look into the clot formation time or the maximum amplitude that indicates your fibrinogen and platelet whenever the maximum amplitude is reduced or the clot formation time is prolonged or alpha angle is reduced for an example, maximum clot firmness is less than 50 mm. It can be because of the fibrinogen deficiency or can be because of the platelet deficiency. Look into the platelet count less than 50,000. You have to give platelet transfusion. Look into the fibrinogen less than 150. So fibrinogen can be hypofibrinogenemia, dysfibrinogenemia. Other way of looking into is the 15. 15 has nullified the impact of the platelet on the maximum clot firmness. So it has shows only the impact of the fibrinogen if it is less than 10 mm that is a fibrinogen is low and so what you have to give fibrinogen replacement by cryoprecipitate it's a one to two units of cryoprecipitate if all the things are normal look into the maximum lysis maximum lysis is more than 15 percent that indicates the hyperfibrinolysis hyperfibrinolysis usually happens during a reperfusion because a uh, lots of tissue factor pathway inhibitors are being generated uh, uh, through uh, the ischemic liver cells so there will be a lot of fibrinolysis so how you treat it giving an amino caproic acid that is an anti-fibrinolytics here you can establish by doing an aptem mode where aprotonin is used which can show the impact of the fibrinolysis when you are doing a reperfusion you are putting on heparin and you need uh, whenever the heparin impact is more than 20 percent you have to do a reversal of the heparin impact to reduce the bleeding manifestation so you have to give iv protein so that is what is uh, also reflected in the um, uh, management of the in the uh, in this uh, cartoon so you are looking into extreme and 15 if there is a hyperfibrinolysis graph look do go ahead with a tranexamic acid if x and 15 are normal graph do an x uh, if x and 15 are normal so uh, try to look into the amplitude no, no, sorry try to look into the in graph and 15 graph and uh, based upon that you can decide whether you need a cryoprecipitate on the platelet transfusion or both the next complication in case of a liver disease is thrombosis is often the Portal venous thrombosis is asymptomatic. 15% patient can have an over portal venous thrombosis at the time of liver transplant. The incidence of occult PBT is even higher. The PBT is associated with portal hypertension, ascites, encephalopathy, intestinal ischemia. It is not known whether the pathophysiology of PBT resembles TBT or not. There can be hepatic artery thrombosis that is absorbed after the surgery. It can be an early or the long term complication. It most often after the metabolic seen in case of a metabolic liver disease like acute intermittent porphyria or familial amyloidal polyneuropathy. Increased risk of hepatic artery thrombosis is also seen if the graft carries a thrombophilia mutation. It can be increased in case of a CMB infection or patient had a prior history of pulmonary uh, portal vein thrombosis. Peripheral thrombosis has been less often absorbed, absorbed between 0.5 to 63 percent. The risk is increased in case of cancer, older age, surgical procedure, inactivity or hospitalization and coagulopathy is not protective of our venous thromboembolism in patients with cirrhosis. So a study shows that vascular event after liver transplant uh, can be seen in uh, and if they are followed, almost 21% of the death is in liver transplant is because of vascular thromboembolism. The risk factor involves are hypertension, age, smoking, renal failure, hypercholesterolemia, and adequate treatment is associated with a reduced risk of venous thromboembolism. Thrombosis can also happen during a orthotopic liver transplant, both early and late. Patients transplanted for metabolic can have an increased risk, as already I have mentioned this uh, risk factors. Treatment. You can go ahead with a aspirin or P2Y12 blocker, but the treatment with a vitamin K antagonist is controversial. Uh, and what should be the target INR cannot be decided because uh, uh, achieving a target INR, you are making the uh, uh, patient more of a bleeder. You are going below, maybe there is a more of a thromboembolic tendency will be there. 
so two studies have shows there is no acceptable uh, uh, very acceptable therapeutic window labels in case of and i use a vitamin k antagonist for as far as inr is concerned enoxaparin has a promising role in portal venous thrombosis and liver decompensate a patient with advanced cirrhosis in small randomized trial of a 12 month course in enoxaparin uh, was safe and effective in preven- preventing the pbd in patients with cirrhosis and enoxaparin appeared to delay the occurrence of hepatic decompensation and improve survival so when we do a uh, anti tna assay to the it has been found that anti tna assay under estimates the low molecular heparin mass in patients with cirrhosis so that is the problem a anti tna assay when we look for a therapeutic monitoring in case of low molecular heparin as you can say uh, the more the severe the disease the anti tna becomes uh, underestimates uh, the low molecular heparin impact Similarly, enhanced anticoagulant potency is being patient, uh, absorbed uh, in patients with liver disease uh, in, uh, when using low molecular weight heparin. As you can see, the percentage decrease in endogenous thrombin potential. Noax in liver disease, like uh, dabigatran, like a uh, direct thri- uh, thrombin inhibitor, or rivaroxaban, like direct thri- anti tna inhibitors, uh, associated with maybe associated with more uh, increased risk of GI bleeding and uh, even with a uh, normal liver function. and both are cleared uh, by the um, uh, liver kidney eh, and uh, they can be used but uh, not explicitly contraindicated in case of a liver disease and when we do monitoring the dabigatran by anti 2a assay and monitoring the rivaroxaban anti 10a assay eh, the both the results of monitoring are reliable with the liver disease eh, even with the severity of the cirrhosis whether child a category or child c category and there is an enhanced anticoagulant potency of dabigatran but there is a decreased anticoagulant potency seen in rivaroxaban patients with liver disease so in short or to summarize routine laboratory test values do not accurately reflect the hemostatic ta- status of the cirrhosis patients or the chronic liver disease patients or liver failure patient the traditional concept that cirrhosis is associated with the hemostasis related bleeding tendency is no longer valid laboratory and clinical support for the concept of rebalanced hemostasis is more helpful transfusion free transplantation is the target and normal hemostatic status is more sophisticated laboratory tests uh, can be achieved by looking into the thrombin generation test or the road or rotem or tech thrombotic risk is more than the bleeding risk so if you try to manage prophylactically bleeding you are making the patient more pro thrombotic studies on optimal anticoagulation management are urgently required so that uh, the uh, we can have a better outcome in case of a liver disease with a hemostatic abnormality so march 5th 2020 was a landmark day for ims and some hospital when we did uh, our first liver transplant uh, uh, the, just before the covid uh, we are the first uh, Uh, hospital in the uh, state of odisha to do a liver transplant like donor liver transplant so this is uh, my lab uh, we have a state of lab with all the facility including rotem and tech you can see in a uh, rotem you can see in the background uh, here so i will acknowledge my team uh, who are constantly uh, supporting uh, Uh, me in carrying out all the laboratory activities and help me in uh, preparing this uh, presentation and thank you any questions i'm glad to take thank you uh, dr rajesh kumar bhola a very extensive presentation very detailed and i think the right person to talk on that i mean you are an expert very very nicely done and it is so true that routine laboratory values do not accurately represent hemostatic status in chronic liver disease and cirrhosis so something which we used to all think of earlier and this is not so easy it's a pretty complex science now and uh, should be left for the experts to handle a very impressive lab uh, and a very impressive speaker wonderfully done sir excellent this yes, please hold the line let me see if there's any questions on the youtube our platform is such that uh, uh, we have most of our viewers who will be viewing this later recorded versions okay so okay. yeah basically uh, the philosophy of our teaching process is that 
we realized over these two years that everybody is not available at a given point of time. And it becomes extremely difficult to get experts like you every time. So it's important that you know we capture knowledge and share it across. And then we have a large segment of people, more than 5,000, who would be viewing this over a period of time. And they routinely send us comments. Now we have a very dedicated master key Google Drive whereupon uh, experts and their contact emails are available and people are directly contacting experts regarding any queries. So maybe by tomorrow or maybe by day after tomorrow, about more than 500, 600 people would have viewed it and mm. gone through it. We also have a protocol of having a Google Drive, a dedicated Google Drive, whereupon all the PDF of the lectures are uploaded. Okay. So I would request you to share the PDF of this lecture so that we can upload it on the Google Drive. And I will share with you the link, the master key link, whereupon you can access all the videos, all the PDFs of all the lectures which have been taken place. Your lecture is lecture number 245. So you already have 245 lectures up till now. That's great, great. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to hold you and to have you here on this, on this platform, sir. You are a wonderful teacher, a, ex a brilliant scholar and very knowledgeable person. I could, I could see the depth of knowledge which you have while you were teaching and the calmness which you had in teaching shows the strength of your knowledge. Excellent presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Thank Unfortunately, you. could not visit your lab in that audit time because of the COVID. But maybe if uh, once things settle down and I do a visit Bhubaneswar, I'll surely like to come and see the state of art. It is supposed to be in a state of art place. I've been told by Dr. Deepak Mishra and the rest of the team there. It's really a privilege and uh, pleasure, sir, interacting with you. And uh, you people, uh, you are all doing a tremendous job uh, in creating this platform for uh, all the postgraduate. And I really expect that this is will be helpful. A lot of help uh, the postgraduates will get from these kinds of presentation. So it is yes. really a pleasure interacting with you. So thank you for those kind words. Uh, not only the postgraduates, the junior consultants, and many of the senior consultants are very much actively involved and they are uh, very open to accept that uh, it has been a definite help uh, in trying to you know go through the minds of experts and understanding the subject from them it is an honor sir to to be hosting you here and i and i, and I know you'll be coming back again with other topics as well so we'll be all waiting for that thank you so much sir once again thank requesting you, sir. you to share the pdf on the mail I'll upload it as soon as I get it right. Sure. right. Take care, Thank sir. Good night. Take care. God Thank bless you. you. Very nice. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.